Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this, well, this topic. And it's an interesting topic. You know, I was meeting with our panelists outside, and we were looking at the gaming world and what it means, how we fit in, maybe how our children fit into it. And today we're going to meet the experts, the people where their businesses, their days are spent looking at this industry as a whole, and even in the world of gaming. We have Roman, Mehran, Tim, Vlad, Lauren, and Ted. Each come at business and in life from a different lens and a different perspective. And I'm interested today to hear their story, what they think gaming will look like. And with that, let's start with Ted. So Ted, talk about what you do, where you're from, and then building communities in the gaming world, because people have different attention spans, do they not? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Dustin. Appreciate you having us up here. I'm sure all of us are excited to chat. Um, you know, gaming to me, uh, I'm an old guy. So when I think about gaming, I think about what it means to my kids, what it means to my, my kids' friends. I see how they interact with gaming. And, uh, you know, what I do is, I, as Dustin said, I focus on communities and building communities. And I think there's an awesome opportunity for us um, if we figure out a way to build the next level of gaming communities properly um, to make that something special that was kind of lost in the past. Uh, I know that I have a very... Gaming had a profound effect on me 35 years ago, and now as I learn more about it, I'm in the industry. Um, it's about building that community and seeing how uh, the youth of today will move forward and how it will be as impactful for them. So I'm excited to talk about it. I think there's a lot going on here. Same question for you, Mehran. Thank you. So um, I work for Fileblocks. So I'm an associate general counsel. I do product and regulatory. I think that the world is changing currently. There is a, an evaluation uh, that is going around. I'm not familiar with that with my children specifically, but I do think that games are important. They're getting more coverage, and I think we should think about legal implication and regulatory in specifics, especially when it's coming in the mean of income. People are getting more and more, and maybe with automation, it will become more meaningful. So maybe you can take it to there as well. Vlad? Yes, hi, hi. Uh, my name is Vlad Mastikov. I do the development of Layer 1. I do also develop different Web3 applications. Um, I'm not that familiar with Gamify. Uh, I, I just like playing games myself. Um, so I think that uh, basically what I'm seeing is that uh, the business model of how game developers and gamers these days uh, try to monetize their audience, uh, it really changes a lot due to blockchain. Uh, we saw this phenomenon in DeFi space uh, that basically uh, trading became super accessible to any basically token holder and now we see the same transition in Gamify uh, and I, I think that uh, I'm at least mostly um, kind of um, fascinated about uh, the fact that uh, at some point in time in the near future we'll see even our kids uh, not just wanting to play the games, but to be engaged in the economic models of the games. Owning NFTs, exchanging them, passing this value among uh, the games, buying stuff uh, in-game. And that's what actually blockchain is helping uh, to make this transition uh, in, in this uh, gaming space. That's what I'm really thrilled about to see. Roman. Yes. Well, thank you for having us here. Uh, well, it's very nice to meet you all, guys. Um, basically, I'm from Relictum. It's layer one blockchain technology. Uh, we're focused on um, smoothing the onboarding process of all the blockchain uh, for the, uh, I don't know, people and companies. In terms of gaming, uh, well, well, I am a huge fan of, well, any game that's, you know, 
is on PlayStation, for example. Uh, but uh, I think that most of you watched uh, Ready Player One movie by Steven Spielberg, so where they fully cover the concept of metaverse that sooner or later will be uh, brought to, to life. So nowadays we must have all the technological, uh, technological basics in order just to let the developers grow the ecosystem and uh, the solutions that would help to bring those ideas that were like shared by Spielberg in his film uh, into a life. So yeah, thanks. Lauren. Yeah, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you AIBC team for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm the director of partnerships for a Web3 game called Illuvium. Um, we are currently in beta testing. We have around 30,000 uh, beta testers um, giving us great feedback on the game. Um, but we are actually delivering three AAA gaming title next, titles next year. Um, and yeah, so it's similar to Pokemon, uh, where people go through a massive metaverse, collect uh, different items, and catch monsters, which we call Illuvials. We have also another game. Another game of the three ones that, that we are building is uh, a mobile and PC game called Illuvium Zero, where people can own land and build digital entities on that land. And the third one is an auto battler game where the Illuvials, the monsters that people catch, uh, they can send them into battle and battle each other or AI. Um, really fascinating to be part of this time where we see really you know, the first time truly gaming becomes not only a hobby, but can be a little bit more. But what fascinates me about this is I've been a gamer for a long, long time, played endless hours of World of Warcraft, but at the end, it was all time wasted because I could not extract any value from this. So blockchain is changing this, and the gaming space is becoming now uh, not only a hobby, could be, uh, will become also much more than just uh, a waste of time through using this uh, incredible technology. And Tim, where are you from? Uh, I'm from the UK. Daniel, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, my name's Daniel. I'm working as a business developer for Zappi, which is a data monetization play-to-earn app. And that will allow users to, uh, whilst playing games, encounter adverts and earn money for actually sharing their feedback on the adverts that they've watched. <coughs> And I'm also working as a head of community for another race engineering simulator uh, that's called Race Me. And that will be a case of using NFT components to build your car and put it to race against other users. And uh, whoever wins takes all the wagered tokens in that race. Um, and yeah, gaming's been a big part of my life for as long as I can remember. Uh, it wasn't World of Warcraft for me, it was, uh, it was RuneScape. And I even did try to engage in illicit forms of uh, play to earn, you know, that contradicted the, the policy of the game until I got banned. And uh, blockchain is changing this, as we know. So it was essentially nonsensical for, to not allow users to profit off their in-game achievements. And that's what I'm so excited about with the integration of blockchain technology and gaming. So then what is this term hyper-casual gaming, Dan? I mean, you and I talked offline. What is it exactly? And who's the right fit for it? Um, anyone can really be, in my opinion, a uh, right fit for hyper-casual gaming. I mean, it requires zero effort uh, besides downloading the app onto your phone. Something to do in your spare time, a big form of escapism for a lot of people. But until now, wasn't something that you could actually profit from. It was a hobby, it wasn't an income generator, or, you know, if you want to be really extreme about it, even a profession. And that's what we're starting to see now. Just by playing a game like Candy Crush, you can actually generate, you know, small pocket money for it. Now, Ted, jumping over to you from experience, you know, once these developers have the idea, you know, how do they tap in to build the community around that? What is that process that you look to create when you're building a business? That's a good question. I think that um, the foundation of it has to be that the game has to be good, I think. I mean, if the, you, know, you talk about these games that you guys played that you were very you're methodical about playing them constantly. Both of you just gave examples. What you do, you, you talked about uh, PlayStation. You like anything on the PlayStation platform. So for me, it, everything goes back to 
building the community because people really like the game. It can't just be about the money. It also has to be something that they want to do and that they really enjoy doing that. That will spur that community to bond because you're doing something and you're loving it and other people around you are loving it too and that's what you have in common. And then that commonality is the foundation of everything else of how you build the community and then you find other things like any friendship or anything else. So I think that's like core value number one in building communities, making a game that's awesome. It's just completely rad and fun to play. And then the monetization of it and the blo utilizing the blockchain I think is genius as long as, you know, from a business perspective, we can actually facilitate that for a long term. And we can build that into a, uh, what I'll make up a generational, you know, um, yeah, in legal terms, consideration, right? So how do we have generational consideration for this game that we love playing? That's how the community will be absolutely rabid. And if you start there and if you win that battle uh, and you have the blockchain aspect to it, game over. So then, Mayron, how important is the legal and compliance framework when you are creating a hyper-casual game or with the ultimate goal of AAA? Well... It's very complicated these days, actually. Uh, NFTs and there are regulatory implications that need to take in mind, especially uh, when most companies are working across jurisdictions. So there's regulatory uncertainty, in a sense. Like, how do regulators refer to NFT? So, for instance, currently we have MICA, in, which is a pending legislation in Europe, that curved out NFTs by category. But in a sense, it didn't really curve it out because it depends on substance over form, uh, meaning that it really depends on the definition of the NFT. And it can fall into other categories under other laws. So I think that for a company today, it's really struggling in finding the right compliance. Vlad, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as a CTO at Everscale. You know, what does it look like from a regulatory framework as you're, as you're in other countries, as you're trying to do everything you can to abide by a system or a rule and working on determining what are the rules? I mean, how do you build as a developer when sometimes there isn't the clarity that one needs in not trying to break rules, actually trying to live within uh, some sort of boundaries. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in a sense, we do need to think that first we should act in good faith. It means that if regulation applies on us, we should be regulated. If a license is required, we should be licensed. But what is actually a license? A license means that we need to follow and comply with certain requirements, and that is it. And if we're not licensed, it also means that still other legislation might be applicable in terms of IP, open source, consumer protection, and this is a very long list. If so let's jump in. I, I love that, because again, general counsel. Now going over to you, Vlad, uh, your thoughts on the topic. On legislation? Framework. Building out. Um, so, I, can you repeat the question? I yeah, I got it. Let, let's uh, dig I into did. the next, just because I think we've got like a minute and a half left. Um, Roman, in the world of layer one technology, you know, how does GameFi build, how is it built inside of that? Or what, what is the, the process? Well, the best process is that, <clears throat> first of all, blockchain should have uh, the SDKs, the APIs, and the full, like, built-in documentation in order to let the developers uh, know what they can do or, or what they cannot. So basically the first thing is just to like follow the developers' needs, ask them, so guys, would you like to do this, this or that? And then when you hear the feedback, you see that you can improve the technology itself. So you, you can add certain things in order just to let developers, like not to limit their minds in terms of technology only. And Lauren, you said this word earlier, AAA, Alluvium. Tell us what that's about. Yeah, so that's actually a 
Well, it's it's a yeah used in gaming, but not really coming from the gaming space. You hear it more when it comes about like triple A more about companies and such. But the gaming industry hijacked that word and uses this word for like describing a game that usually is high budget, high time, development time, and a great output with being a blockbuster game, for example, attracting millions of gamers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a gaming native uh, classification, but actually just proves that the game is really built for, it's an outstanding game with outstanding graphics, with outstanding development time, um, and most blockbuster games that we know are actually AAA games, obviously, um, and those are not common in Web3. So now the Web3 space, you will see the word AAA game on a lot of different titles, but honestly, they are not, because it takes time to build a AAA game. It's years of development, and it's really, you, you have to build a big gaming studio to deliver on that. Your thoughts as well, Dan? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it's going to be a while, obviously, before Web3 uh, developers have the resources and the money and the technology to develop what AAA developers have been making for a long time. So the challenge, really, for the blockchain space is to help the existing AAA uh, developers onboard aspects of blockchain technology. It's fair to say that GameFi didn't necessarily get off to the best start with the uh, Axie debacle and the hack that followed that. But none of that should make you any less bullish on the underlying technology and the power of NFTs to be fully interoperable between different games, owned by you and you only, as opposed to the game. And for that reason, we have so much to look forward to in terms of actually allowing people to generate an income on the games that they're playing. Yeah. Thank you again to our panelists, and thank you to all of you for joining us on this topic of games, hyper-casual to AAA. Thank you again. Thank you, panelists. Let's give them a round of applause.